Thank you. Thank you for the lovely introduction and for inviting me. And I have to say, uh, talking up to Cad is going to be really hard. So, <laughs> so um, I let me start by uh, try to entertain you a little bit uh, with uh, a tweet. This is a fake tweet. Okay. So let's assume I am tweeting the poll. So if the government had had a threat. Uh, thousands will die in a plan to save fossil fuel industry. Uh, this is, I have so much evidence about this. This is going to be a bulletproof evidence that is coming from the FBI and the CIA uh, agency. And so, basically, how would be your reaction if I would get on Fox News or Fox <laughs> now? And I said, I stand up there, he was talking about that algorithm. I stand up there, this is a good algorithm. I stand up there and said, okay, so FBI and CIA are saying that we are absolutely certain that there is a bullet profile against our serious client on our web. And we are so certain that we can tell you that a jumbo jet will be hijacked and crash every 12 days, unless we do something. And so, even though this is a, by far an overstatement, uh, I think at the end of the talk, I hope to try to convince you that actually that is the amount of evidence that we have of the number of people that are dying today because we are trying to save um, the uh, police. So our government knows how to stop this threat, uh, but believes that in this Taking necessary steps that might affect segments of our economy. Okay, oh, so our government knows how to stop this uh, this threat, but believes that taking necessary steps might affect segments of our economy, controlled by the friends of the Trump administration. So officials are going are just going to let the plane crashes forever. Fake news or real news? By the way, the uh, two gentlemen show here are the Cox brother. Um, just to as, a, as information, the Cox Comet pollution, meanwhile, is how paces oil giants, including Valero, Chevron, and Shell, and across its uh, uh, businesses, Cox generated 24 million metric tons of greenhouse gases a year. So there is the evidence, and there is something that we know what to do about it, but in my, I would say, not very humble opinion, we know how to stop it, but we are not stopping it. So let me go backward a little bit uh, about the 70s. Um, so I just tell you where we are now. Oh, if you just opened the New York Times today. And now let's go back in the 1970s. This was the President Nixon signing the Cleaner Act. The Cleaner Act was actually an extremely, I would say, visionary uh, law. Um, and basically what it does is, you know, in a nutshell, establish the national ambient air quality standards. These are safe level of uh, air pollution that we are allowed to breathe. And it's actually it's based on the, the science because the act was, as a part of the law, what we do is we review the evidence to see as whether or not the current level of pollution that we are breathing affect human health. And if the answer is yes, by law, we ask the state and the government to lower the level. And so, uh, you see, data science, actually, in this context, of course, is much more than data science, but it worked. Uh, in the, you know, after what's passed, so if you look at the level of all of the major criteria, air pollutant in the air, these are the trends over time of how the different level of air pollution in the air have been de declining. I mean, they have been declining much, much faster since the 1970s, but they're keeping declining thanks to, I would say, one of the few law that we have in the United States and policy that is driven by data science. And that's exactly how it works. So there's the EPA sets the National Ambient Air Quality Standard. There are studies that are done all around the world. The EPA review the epidemiological evidence. And if the epidemiological evidence said the current standards are not safe, they put the, uh, intervention in place, and, and the level keep going, uh, keep going down. 
there is absolutely no doubt um, from EPA analysis that the uh, Cleaner Act is cost effective. Uh, I'm not going to go into that, that's not even in my field, but I think there is a pretty much undeniable evidence that if you take the number of health outcomes and the health benefit that we all get compared to the additional expenses uh, due to regulation, there is a, a cost benefit uh, ratio of several, uh, several billion dollars. And one thing to think about is in the context of breathing air pollution, you have to think that it's not something like you know, smoking a cigarette or eating an healthy food. It's something that, well, for sure everyone is breathing. <laughs> you have to breathe. My grandmother mother used to say, well, it's a better than an alternative. But also that you can choose whether or not you want to breathe polluted air or not polluted air, right? So, and it's also, it's something that should be allowed for everyone, regardless of your socioeconomic status or where you are. And so this is where we are today. This is actually a real news where the EPA is announcing to repeal the, uh, one of the major uh, Obama air carbon emission rules. And by the way, for people that are not familiar, uh, o o Obama passed a law few, a few years ago was really to cut greenhouse gases emission from power plants. Um, and uh, most of the sources of ambient pollution comes from power plants, especially from coal uh, power, power plants. And so one of the information they use is a leaked draft of the repeal proposal asserts that the country will save 33 billion by not complying with the regulation and rejects the health benefits of the Obama administration as calculated from the original rule. Of course, no one knows where this number are uh, coming from. So that's what I'm going, I'm going to tell you my data science story. And that's where we go back to the question of whether or not we should really use the best possible data and the best of our knowledge to make policy regulation in an area of serious controversy and actually attack um, toward the EPA and toward the, our, I think, right to breed, to breed um, human hair. So very recently, I led the team of my colleagues are all cited here that we worked on uh, this, this, uh, this paper. And I'll tell you why in a second why this is a data science story. But the key question here that we were asking is whether the levels of pollution that we are breeding to today are safe, even when they are below the safety standard. So I show you that, that trend, and I show you that the level of pollution are going down. And the question is, still, even if now we're much, much better than what we're supposed to do, are the current level of pollution that we're breathing today safe? And so uh, what we did with this study was, I think, you know, I'm pretty confident, was a massive data exercise. And by data science exercise, I mean when you're thinking about a represented population or the unrepresented population, this is everybody. So basically we took the entire, um, well, 97% of the population in the United States older than 65 years old, and we can track them because in the United States, people that are older than 65, the great majority of them are enrolled into the Medicare system. So we know the day of entry, we know the age, we know the race, we know their zip code of residence, we have a lot of information about them and we can follow them over time. And we constructed Going back to bulletproof evidence here, we constructed the cohort of everyone. There are 60 million enrollees followed over time and, and you know, at, at the point of collecting 480 million uh, records. So the other piece that was always an attack to the previous epidemiological study was that air pollution is not monitored everywhere in the United States. I mean, in my opinion, it's monitored actually pretty well, but again, it's not perfect. So this map shows where are located the air pollution monitors in the United States. And by the way, this is the air pollution data. It's publicly available, and the EPA actually has a beautiful website. That's where I grabbed the, 
uh, the, the map. Everyone can get to this, um, this data. You have the daily levels of all of the major pollutants in the United States in the last 20 years for all of these monitoring stations. But one of the problem is if you see, even though there are, there are several thousands of monitors, there is a political problem here that you see that most of the monitors are in the area that are more populated. And the area they are more populated are also the area they have tends to have pollution that are a little bit higher. So if we really want to ask the question whether or not the level, the lower level are safe, we need to go beyond where the air pollution is, uh, is monitored. We need to go to another area. So that's where I think in the context of a, a, a extremely controversial and a billion dollars question environmental policy, we actually started to rely and importantly increasingly rely on computer science. And so this is actually, by no means I want to take any credit of this work. This was, was work of actually of the uh, lead author of this paper, Chen Di, who is a graduate student, who actually spent an entire year in the computer science of the department at Harvard and had this great idea, which I'm sure people in computer science go, oh, come on, we do this every day, right? So they basically what they did, they developed a neural network model for exposure prediction. So what happened is that in addition of data from monitoring station, we actually can have imprecise measures of pollution from satellite data. And satellite are actually available, satellite data are available everywhere. So they basically use a simulation output from chemical transport model that are actually very, very widely used. They use input from um, satellite data. They use uh, other information like traffic, population density. And so basically they have a meteorological variable, satellite variable, land use terms, um, uh, uh, chemical model output, and they train a neural network and they estimate, and we estimate ambient level of pollution for every one kilometer to one kilometer grid for all of the continental United States for every day for the last 10 years. Uh, that's where I think, and that's, you know, of course I am, you know, proud of my work, but that's where I think there is an amazing intersection and, and very powerful intersection of using state of the art, and even better, I'm sure that many of you, if you're experts in this type of algorithm, you might have better ideas or even to feed this algorithm, right? But the idea is to take some of this idea and bring it within the larger um, goal, and for us, the measure of success, just quoting Caddy, was to really ask the policy question, can I give you bulletproof evidence that we need to act on our uh, to protect our, our environment. So we, we did this, uh, this, this prediction, and by the way, the um, validation, the validated data, and the accuracy of that uh, uh, prediction was uh, extremely high, up, up to 90%. So that is actually some of the map we, we showed. By the way, there was a problem, if you see the bottom of Texas, talking also about uh, transparencies. There, there was a problem with the satellite. We didn't have data there, and so that's why it's, it's, uh, it, it, it's not that people there don't, uh, don't, don't, don't breathe any pollution. They do, but just we don't know. That's a missing data. So we were able now, we have data on daily level of, this is uh, for fine particulate matters, all around the United States. As I said, a one kilometer to one kilometer grid, um, and, you know, we knew that PM 2.5 tends to be much higher in the east part of the United States than the, in, uh, in the west part, except, of course, the uh, California region. And we also did the analysis for ozone. So let me just talk back for a moment. Fine, fine particular matter are, are caused mostly from um, fossil fuel uh, burning, so uh, power plants, um, and traffic, and are mostly uh, caused by com combustion sources. Ozone is mostly, is a gas, is the, and we're talking about ground level ozone, is mostly caused by uh, traffic and uh, react uh, with higher temperature. And so this is the uh, map of, of ozone. So now let's talk about data, right? So the data is basically our 60 million Medicare uh, participants per year, okay? So this is a population of 67 million, this is a cohort of 67 million per year, 
followed uh, from 2000 to 2012. We look at all cause of mortality. We have all kinds of uh, information from them, which by no means is perfect, but we have date of death, age, uh, and year of entry in the cohort, gender. And also it's very important we have whether or not they're eligible for Medicaid. And so being eligible for Medicaid is a strong signal uh, of a lower uh, socioeconomic status. And then we, we augment this data at this point with the zip, zip code level from, uh, uh, from census and so on. And so I know this, this uh, uh, picture is really ugly and boring, but on the other hand, I think that when you're trying to do something like that, this is actually the boring, nasty stuff that needs to be done, it needs to be done really, really well. And so basically we had terabytes and terabytes of data try to link from all of the health data and the exposure data and the, and so basically the full documentation and, and, and workflow of, uh, of this and basically creating a data set of 460 million um, observation. So now I wanna take, now that I gave you the political land, landscape of where we are, which you know, for people that follow the news, it was nothing news, right? It was real news. Then I told you uh, the study that we have, you know, that we, we, we just recently uh, co 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 completed, and I'll tell you what that means. And then I want to take a little parenthesis to talk about what I think is the paradigm shifting from hypothesis first to data first where are we are uh, uh, considering now this new era of data science. And there is nothing good or bad about it. It's just so that I do think, and also you know, participating to this, to, to, to this symposium today, I do think that this paradigm is really applying you know, in our data science area. So the paradigm shifting is that, you know, I just have there a picture of Fisher, who's a statistician, and the, 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 the famous couple of T experiment, I don't know how many of you were, are, are, are um, f familiar with the experiment, basically was a lady that, that said, an English lady that said that she was able to recognize by drinking her tea whether it was first the tea and then the milk or first the milk and then the tea. But the, the point I wanna make is on the left part, oops, on the left part of the slide, I think in the general paradigm of s statistical inference, we used to have a specific hypothesis to conduct a control experiment, to run the experiment, and to test the hypothesis. And then we reported, I mean, you know, this is old fashioned statistics, and we reported the p value in terms of saying to what degree we um, have evidence that the data. Uh, they're coming again from this superpopulation is consistent with our null hypothesis. I think where we are right now, and for sure the world I'm living right now, it's going very far from, from that. We are in the world of data science, and we are actually going from starting from an hypothesis to testing the hypothesis in the context of a very controlled experiment to actually be swamped by data and then thinking about extracting important rigorous information uh, from that, uh, that data. And this is important at least for how I was seeing my own work because there is nothing about a control experiment about what I've been doing. There is nothing about even sampling. I have the whole sample. <laughs> and there is nothing about it, you know, thinking to repeat in this experiment. What, what does it mean? And so I think the, the point I'm gonna make, which is actually very familiar, is you know, we are in the data science really transitioning more from a control group, which is nice and very well governed in the context of running an experiment, to the out, to the out of, of control group. And I think we are very much, all of us, are out of control. And so this is my point here, is that, you know, is there anything that we can control so we can make inference about today's world? And so going back to my data science story, I am completely at loss in the context of environmental policy and data science and, and, and environment to think about first a control experiment, to think about testing a specific hypothesis, to thinking about controlling. I can randomize 480 million people to breed uh, 
you know, polluted hair or clean hair. So I do think that an important paradigm, and I think an important opportunity for data science is that really to be able to take the information that we have and get the best possible knowledge out of it. So let me go back to my data science story. So I do think that in general, and I, you know, I'm giving this example in the context of environmental policy, but I do believe, and I'm sure that, that you know, I'm preaching to the choir here, that not using the best possible data and best possible st statistical rigor to inform regulatory policy, but any other regulatory policy, is something that should concern us very deeply. And so what we have done actually with this uh, analysis, it by no means anything, well, we could have done anything from a statistical methodology particularly innovative. We use a pretty much standard um, statistical model, but we thought a lot about the difference, for example, from pre pre prediction and using artificial neural network for prediction. And that's is perfectly valid to have a black box if what I want to do is uh, to pre predict exposure to air pollution. I want to basically make that prediction, I want to have that prediction to be as accurate as possible can be. I don't care what's going inside the black box. But now when I'm going to estimate the effects of pollution on human health, I need to have an interpretable model where I'm sure I can disentangle the effects of pollution from the, from the effect of from all of the other variables. So anyway, we, you know, I don't think I'm going to spend much time about all of the statistical analysis, but I think it was pretty much bread and butter statistical analysis. So let me give you some sense about the, the data, right? So as I said, one thing that we were particularly interested in is in estimating the effects of pollution at level below the national ambient air quality standards. So, so for PM, PM 2.5, the current level of national, the current levels of the national ambient air quality standard is a 12 microgram per cubic meter. And the for ozone, actually for ozone, there are really no standards, but what's considered a safety standard is a 50 um, part per billion. And so having such an enormous amount of data allowed us to actually have up to, uh, in the context of PM 2.5, 11 million people around the United States that are breathing level of pollution that are lower than the standard, and so they're considered to be, uh, to be safe. I'm sorry, so we have 32 million that breathe, that breathe pollution that are lower than the standard, up to 11 million that, uh, that died. So here is where also one of the other differences between a standard that we'll call it a standard paradigm of testing an hypothesis, which is perfectly valid and great in the context of the experiment, and in dealing with big data and massive data science, is that you know, the, this p-value makes absolutely no sense here to report the p-value. We have a p-value actually up to the 22 decimal points was so less than 101, right? And so the confidence interval, and it was so funny actually for me that it was after working on this paper for two years so that I realized how tiny were these confidence intervals at the point that the student asked me, why are we having a confidence interval? Confidence interval actually here makes absolutely no sense because I'm not sampling, it's everybody. All right, wait, it's 97 97% of the population. But you see also what, what I'm getting into is it, it doesn't mean that these, these are correct. <laughs> this could be all equally wrong with very, very tiny confidence interval. But the way that we quantify evidence, oh, sorry, not quantify evidence, uncertainty is very different. And so what, what we found, uh, unless the none of these results are completely confounded, that even at levels well below the national ambient air quality standards, an increase of only one microgram per cubic meter in PM 2.5 is actually killing 12,000 senior citizens uh, each year. And so that's where I'm going back. That is equivalent. Of course, if I explain it to this table, no one will understand, but that's what I meant to where this is equivalent to a jumbo jet crashing every, uh, every 12, uh, 12 days. Now, we did additional analysis. I thought that what was considering, actually particularly interesting what was Caddy was saying, because when we estimated these health effects of pollution for different groups, uh, the, you know, uh, stratified by gender, socioeconomic status, and color, it was actually very interesting to see that people of color and blacks actually have a mortality risk associated with air pollution that was 
over uh, 3.5 higher than, uh, than the national average. So, um, and of course, you know, we, we actually, this is of course, but this is also important that we re report um, those response curve. And actually with this type of data, uh, it's pretty interesting to see that there is actually no safe level that these are, those response curve are, um, are pretty, pretty linear. So the other interesting part about data science, and this is a data science story, which I was actually extremely surprised, is that the editors of the New England Journal of Medicine, not only you know, themselves wrote a commentary, but they took a very strong political position against the Trump administration, which was actually, I was extremely surprised. This is not something that, well, first of all, this was a data science article, so it's already surprising they got to the New England Journal of Medicine, but also the fact that we didn't do any we didn't make any political statement. We, we make policy statement, but they made a very strong political statement and said, in explaining his withdrawal from the Paris Climate Agreement, Trump stated, I was elected to represent the citizen of Pittsburgh. It's interesting mentioning Pittsburgh, not Paris. Uh, ironically, Pittsburgh is less than 30 miles from the Donora Smog Museum where a sign reads, clean air started here. Without, with the report of DL et al, adding to the larger body of evidence, indicating the risk of air pollution, even according to current standards, we, we must re, redo, redouble our commitment to clean air. If such a protection lapse, Americans will suffer and we are doomed to repeat stories. Do we really want to breathe air and kill us? So, that, that was the boring part of the story. Now let me tell you the fun part of the story. So now here is a data scientist, a group of nerds at Harvard. We want to test, you know, we really provide, want to provide evidence. As you can imagine, a type of commentary in a type of paper has created some, I give us some enemies. And so here is uh, Steve Milloy, who has a website, it's called Junk Science who is basically since, of, you know, as soon as in data science, you are trying to make a statement that was gonna impact the regulatory policy quite sub, sub, substantially, people will go after you. And so, uh, of course, not only after me, but after many of my, of, of my colleagues in terms of criticizing, uh, criticizing the work. So if you go on his website, he's basically accusing us of scientific misconduct and all kinds of other interesting things. And so that's where then I go back, it's like, okay, now uh, what do you do about it and how do you respond? And so I think going back to a data science story and a good data science lesson, I think also that's, I don't think that we will never be able to change the mind of Steve Malloy or what we do or what is true and why, why we're doing it. But I think that we all agree that the importance of open science and reproducible research in the context of Contentual, uh, contentious uh, question is very important. And so uh, I just want to make a distinction that a study is replicated where new data is collected and analyzed independently by new set of investigators. And the context of our pollution research, this has been done over and over, where a study is re re reproduced when the same data is reanalyzed independently by a new set of, uh, of investigators. In our context, uh, doing open science is a by no means a trivial task. There are scalability of computer and storage that are over you know, several terabytes. And also I think to really overcome though for a very important policy agenda, to overcome what was considered the secret science bills where actually this new bill of the EPA where all the science that is open science can be used for, a, for a regulatory policy. And so I'm just concluding by saying that even though the amount of critics uh, that we are expecting to, to see, uh, the, input, the input of this work and in general the input of the data science work will be and will lie, even if for now we're, I, I don't know if we'll be able to uh, change regulatory policy, in the importance of open science and re reproducible research. And so actually we will be making available what I call this open science platform, where the step one, where there is the artificial neural network model that will estimate pollution all around the US 
the step, you know, and the validation, the step two, which is the linkage with all the data sources, all of the parts of the statistical analysis and so on, everything will be made uh, rep reproducible. That means also opening us and making us extremely vulnerable to uh, interest party and to, you know, being ready to be basically said that, you know, there will be something wrong or being um, seriously uh, criticized. So that's, that's what, what I meant by the open science framework because I do think that data science and the impact regulatory policy must be open science for all of the reason that Katia has been telling us uh, because you cannot rely on important uh, regulatory decision based on algorithms that are secret. And so that is a just uh, the, um, you know, a snapshot of the open science framework home. And so I just want to conclude with a quote, which is, in God we trust, all others must, uh, must bring data. And, oh, I'm sorry, I, before I go to the question, I want to make sure I was looking for this slide. But I know I mean that this is actually work of a lot of, of my colleagues. Uh, the lead author of the paper is Chen Di, who is a PhD student in environmental health and biostat, and my colleague Joel, um, Joel uh, Jours, and Yun and Christine, and many others, as well as, and this is also something I should, I should mention, uh, to run a survival model with 480 million observation was actually not easy and so what we did we got the entire harvard supercomputer resources dedicated to us uh, on christmas day and christmas eve and that's how we will be able to run some of the analysis so happy to take uh, any question thank you for your attention uh, we do have uh, time for um any questions that might uh any, any audience members want to pose a question? Well, while, while we're waiting, I'll, I'll ask you a question, sure. just a, a general, um, just to get your, um, your perspective. Over the past uh, two or three years, there's been movements to um, either defund or replace many of the assets that uh, satellite weather uh, and remote sensing and so forth with uh, uh, assets that are either for, uh, funded from private companies and therefore uh, don't have uh, necessarily the, uh, uh, don't satisfy the same standards as, as yeah. public uh, resources. Does that affect the, um, uh, the, the application of techniques, statistical techniques like, like you're discussing here um, in the light of the fact that you no longer have a sort of a, a monolithic uh, uh, network of, yeah. of sensors that's um, uh, that, that is controlled by uh, yeah. you know, the public trust and yeah. as opposed to the private private industry yeah yeah no i mean yeah oh sorry <laughs> now now i remember there is a microphone uh yes big big time and um and again just going through the history of environmental research uh when you know you read you know, around that climate scientists and environmental scientists are under attack, are really under attack. I mean, uh, it's, this, was, this, this was a giant study that we did, uh, but the first study that we did, which was actually 10 <coughs> years ago, was the first study of our pollution and mortality where we had a sample of 100 cities. And we used the data from the National Center of Health Statistics. And there was a similar story you know, it was it, what was actually was the study that impacted the, the first revision of the National Ambient Air Quality Standard. It was a New England Journal of Medicine, big deal. As a result of the sound evidence, they lowered the standard. And you know what happened in the year, out, and I, we actually had open science pl platform. We had the data available. The following year, the National Center of Health Statistics declared the data are not available anymore. Mm. And they're not available to me, they're not available to anyone. They completely eliminated the availability of access to this data. Mm. And so uh, what's happened here, and that's what is the dangerous trend, that as a data scientist, and I think that's what I was trying to also communicate, that as you're gonna do things that are more and more important, at the point they're gonna impact multi-billion dollar industry, you might be, you know, facing this type of threat or actually actual, you know, reality where data gets 
made not available. And so mm -hmm. when uh, Trump was elected, I mean, this is a very well known, there was a consortium of scientists, of data scientists around the US that they all downloaded all the data from the EPA. We actually have all copies of all the data from the EPA on a secret server uh, because we're expecting that moving forward, less and less data will be available and some of the sensors will not be measured anymore. So yeah, but that's, that, that's the reality we live. Yeah, yeah. concerning. Very concerning. So there's a, there's a question here on the left. Yes, about your left, I guess, right? Yes, uh, well, stage left, <laughs> yes. All right. <laughs> Uh, thank you. You've done a wonderful job of gathering a lot of data, but part of me wonders if you really have enough. And I say this because what I see here is high correlation. I don't see causality. Mm -hmm. um, one of the first stat courses I ever had, uh, the, what was put to us is that, did you know that ice cream causes rape? And we're like, what? What are you talking about? Well, we map out how yeah, ice cream is consumed, and we notice that that tracks very closely with the incidence of rape. Well, you know, most people, I think, would look at it and say, no, ice cream does not cause rape. Here you've got pollution, and you've got high incidence of mortality, but I don't see that that shows causality, mm -hmm. okay? Now, I don't doubt that pollution is, is yeah. bad, oh, of course. Yeah. but I think, you know, looking when you talked about the covariates, I don't see anything in there, you know, a rural environment, maybe there's less stress, maybe people are out walking in the meadows, I mean, I, you know, I don't know. So mm -hmm. I think there's a challenge here in what you're presenting if we want to talk about the pollution is it. And also in your own data, you showed that blacks three and a half times the incidence. Obviously, there's another set of factors there. Yeah. So I, it, that concerns me a little bit uh, because you believe right off, it, it's very clear from the start of this that you believe air pollution's a problem, boom, 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 and that sets your framework. Uh, but, and you talk as if it's causality when what we're seeing right here is correlation. Yeah. I don't know, you got a yeah. response Oh, absolutely, no, but what, what you're talking about is the issue of confounding for, you know, in any context of an observational study. So, and I, I started and I wrote this talk in a very provocative manner for purposes. But so, I think that, you know, in the context of environmental health or in the context of climate change, in the context of many of these data science questions, you cannot do a randomized experiment, right? I can't, right? We can, I can send you to breathe, you know. So, so as soon as you're outside of a randomized control experiment, you got an observational study. And when you got an observational study, you have to do the best, you can never, ever, ever rule out confounding. So you have to do the best that we, have, we can, right? And so um, I claim that, you know, my training and my area of expertise is on causal inference. And, and so we, you try to do the best that you can to adjust for residual confounding. Now, I didn't have it, you know, all of the time to go through all of this, but, you know, there were sense, so they, this Medicare and release, then I think about the Medicare data, and then I think, then I think about building this database over time is that you actually know all of the previous hospitalization that every early has had in their lifetime. So you have actually pretty good information about their uh, comorbidity history. We were able to estimate pollution at the zip code level, and so the, at the zip code level, you have 100 and 100 and 100 variable from census data. And then there was another cohort, which is a random sample of that cohort, where actually you have smoking information and so on. So you have to consider as this to be the first of, you know, many investigation of a larger data science platform. Now, can you all, can you completely rule out the confounding from this study? No, that's never going to be possible. Can we get the best possible data together with the best possible statistical rigor in the context of causal inference? So then we can get closer to causality. Well, that's, that is my measure of success. So, but thank you for your question. Okay, it's a you. very valid one. One from, so this is a tremendous scale of analysis and it's very important. I think your slide, you emphasize older adults risk, but it applies at all ages, I believe. Yeah. In any case, I wanted to just point out for the historical record that this beautifully replicates work that was much criticized at the time from Lester Lave and Eugene Seskin 
in science in the 1970s. And the heart of it was that the relative risk is rather small. But multiplied by the size of the affected population, of course, the consequences are huge. Yeah. Yeah. No, and, and, and the, the, but the, the crazy thing about all of this business is that the evidence, the consistency over time of the effects of air pollution on human health, of the different studies, whatever, a simple study, large study, complicated, big, is remarkable consistency, which I found remarkable because of all of the potential confounding. And what I found striking is that even with, I think, this amazing level of consistency, we today are facing a world where we are thinking to go backward yeah. and not to, to implement such, such a regulation. So we knew, we knew from the 1970s, right. but also, we needed more data all the time. Right. I think it also makes a, a firmer impression if you go from all deaths to, uh, for medical audiences especially, to particular category of death, which is pulmonary and cardiovascular. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We so the 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 uh, that data, the mortality data from the Medicare, it doesn't provide the cause of that. I think we could estimate it, so we will not be able to do that. But we we could do it. We have done cost-specific hospitalization uh, as well. So, but yeah. Thank you. Great. Uh, right. Two quickies here. I've just uh, we've got you on the stage. I've got to hear this. Um, how much have you been able to collect NCAR data and NOAA data? I mean, how much data has your group really co collected? That's number one. Number two is, are you starting to see data taken off the sites and, uh, you know, see differences between what you have been able to archive and what's actually out there right now? Yeah, so, and actually, that's remind me, you know, bummer, I, sh I should have a slide that list, list them all. Uh, so. Um, it's actually funny because the, the <laughs> you know, I mean, it's funny, I mean, it's funny, but um, all of the data sources are part of the study are all data that actually are paid by the government. <laughs> it's gonna, you know, it's a criticize the government, right? So there is the NASA data with the satellite. There is the NOAA data because we have all of the weather data. There is the EPA data because it's all their pollution data. Uh, there is uh, the traffic data from the Department of Transportation. Yeah. There is uh, the Medicare data, which is, you know, from Center of Medicare and Medicaid Services. There is the census data. There is the data from the behavioral risk factor survey. And I'm sure there are more, I don't remember. So, uh, and that's also the other thing that uh, this is very different from, and this is a data science reaction to criticism because my colleagues, there were studies by, you know, there was a, this, the Harvard Six City study and the American Cancer Society study on air pollution and health, and these studies were heavily, heavily criticized. Of course, my study is going to be criticized as well. But, but the reason why they were criticizing that study was they were considered secret science because so they enrolled patients and they could not distribute the data to everyone. And so now the point that we are making here and investing an enormous amount of resources and time in making the data research platform available, even though I know I'm got, my head is gonna be on the table because as soon as we you know, open up all of this, there will be, you know, there are, you know, harm is a paid consultant to say that this study is flawed and I'm sure you will hear that on the news, but I do think that, that at, at the very least, they cannot say that the science is secret. The science is meant uh, to be open, so then issue about confounding uh, can be viewed in multiple ways, and I hope I always go from the long, <laughs> the long perspective, and I think that that's what data science and open science should do. Thank you for this extraordinary effort. I did see today that there's an emergency request in Congress for funding uh, the Census Bureau, which is out of money. So I think we're going to see a lot of this, right. and thank you for bringing it to our attention. Yeah, thank we'll you. take one more question over here. Thank you. Um, yeah. So thank you for your talk. Um, you talked a little bit about like the current administration's attitude um, toward data and science, um, and especially with um, a lot of people, including the president, just calling things that they don't agree with or that don't support them, like fake news or alt facts. Um, even even when data is supposed to be truth when, and should be informing a lot of policy and, and should be the way that we can better our society. Um, 
when things that, that are challenging people's be beliefs are, are just getting like written off completely, um, I was wondering if you had any um, advice in communicating uh, your results on, on climate science. I know you talked a little bit about the haters, but if you could share any, any advice in trying to communicate effectively in a way, because right, if, if your study is true um, and your, your results are true and they, and they should be helping things, um, then how to communicate that with people, even, even if it is challenging for them or that they don't want to believe. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Uh, I don't have, you know, I really don't have the answer except to say that um, I think that um, it's, it's the job of us as a collectively, above and beyond. I think there is so much a single investigator and a single study can do, but I do think that is a ethical responsibility of the data science community to keep pushing the agenda, which is any major decision that affects all of us, they are not based on rigorous data, it's something that should concern us collectively deeply. And so it's much above and beyond this study or this particular study, right? And so I think that that has been my mantra to go off of the conversation about you know, you didn't do this, you could have done that, you could have looked at it in this way, you forgot to measure this or that, but it's, it's about going from evidence-based science to, you know, something else. And I think the reality right now, I don't believe that the evidence from this study is gonna change because of the government that we have right now. Maybe I am, even though I'm overly optimistic in general, I think in this particular case, what they will do and what they're trying to do to be very honest, is try to shut down the study and shut my reputation as much as they can. You know, so th that's what they will do. But I do think we're not gonna be in the same administration for forever. And so I think that that's why in the work, the academic work goes on for here. And so that's why I see it in the long, in, you know, in the long term, I think that's where I feel that this is a, just an example to show you how important data science is because we will be able to rely more and more on data and I think that we have the unique opportunity with the right leadership in place, which I will arrive, that we can impact policy based on fact. So, but thank you. Thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you very much.